narrow path live and in color and it is by the time you're getting this sunday morning at 10 a.m so i pray that if you you know played hooky or if you just decided to come in later and watch after you went to church that you uh, receive a little nugget today because that's what i'm gonna try to leave you a little morsel a little something to chew on today we're gonna this we're in john chapter 21 now we're gonna finish this baby we could probably finish it today, but I'm not going to do that because I want to save part two of John chapter 21 because I think it's a very unique one. It kind of applies to my own life too, so some of that maybe will come out uh, as we end this wonderful, fascinating gospel. I pray that if you have not gone through um, this this teaching in John chapter 20, this devotional teaching, admittedly, um, to go back and watch from the beginning where I give the introduction because this is really... Um, you know, other than the last couple of chapters where we've been going through the crucifixion and, and the resurrection and everything, uh, there's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, content there that is related to how we walk on this narrow path and, and so much more. So I pray you'll you'll get into that. So I don't want to uh, belabor too much today. I'll keep my handy dandy nerd glasses just in case I need them. They're all foggy. I should probably fix that. Before we get into John chapter 21, though, I guess, you know, I like little catchy titles. And because I'm old, you know, I sometimes relate it to like songs and stuff. So I would, I call this, I wanted to come up with something more clever than, than the jet plane. But I call this leaving on a jet plane because it reminds me of a song. Leaving on a jet plane, don't know when I'll be back again. And really, I could kind of add that to the title because there's there's a truism there that we're going to talk about as it relates to Jesus and where we're at now. I want to read real quickly a comment too by uh, John, um, by uh, Craig Keener, who's, who's a, who's a, a brilliant and has written a commentary on John who, who I, I partially used to get some added insights in, in addition to my own study. But one thing he says, I, th I think it's really interesting. He says, since throughout John's focus, it has been on the continuing and abiding presence of Jesus. He closes his gospel with a resurrection encounter rather than the announced ascension. If you remember back when we finished verse 17 of John chapter 20, um, John mentions that Jesus says, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brethren and say that I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. Instead, that's going to be covered, of course, in the book of Acts. But uh, there's some really, really neat things that John wants us to get as this uh, chapter um, wraps up his gospel. Um, and, and getting back to the leaving on a jet plane, that's in fact what Jesus is doing. He's getting ready to, not on a jet plane, but his, his very special jet plane, he's just poof, and he ascends, okay? He just does because he's Jesus and he can do that. But, you know... When you think about Jesus leaving, um, and imagine his disciples who leaving. He's already left them once very abruptly. His crucifixion, he told them over and over this was going to happen. He'd be delivered over, and he would be crucified uh, mercilessly. And they didn't believe him. And it happened. Peter denied him. Judas betrayed him altogether. The rest of them ran, hid for fear of the Jews. We talked about that in our last up at bat. And uh, now he's he's coming to see them. This is going to be his third appearance now. And uh, of course, we'll we'll read about uh, we'll read a little bit about um, the. Actually, I'm just going to go ahead and read it now because Paul writes in kind of talking about the gospel, and he says in First Corinthians fifteen three to eight, which we may be getting into First Corinthians very soon. He says, "For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received that Christ died for our sins." according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. We hear about that in the book of Acts, most of whom remain until now at the time Paul's writings, which was probably late forties, early fifties of first Corinthians. Okay. Um, but some, who remain until now, but some to the 12, and that he appeared to the more than 500 brothers at one time, mentions that twice, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen 
asleep. So others have already passed on um, as well. And after that, he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, to one untimely born, he appeared to me also, for I am the least of the apostles and not worthy to be called apostle because I have persecuted the church of God. Man, oh man, didn't Paul carry that with him um, till his till his dying day? Sometimes um, sin will do that to us. We we God has brought us so many places, but he never, I'm sure, could forget. Maybe we don't really know, though. We can guess, but the, the whole measure of it that he, at his hands, if you will, he was the religious mafia hitman to, uh, you know, he watched S Stephen die, might as well throw the stones himself, and how many others were not really told. So he carried that with him. But we feel this Jesus leaving, and I, I'm using the title from the song, Leaving on a Jet Plane, Don't Know When I'll Be Back Again. But Paul and others, of course, too, you know, really felt that his return was imminent. Um, you know, they, 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 Paul in his writings, you know, he's, 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 he's warning people to not worry about this, that, and other, and some things are just not really worth paying a whole lot of attention to, spend a whole lot of time on, because he's, he's, you know, they're going to be checking out soon, and he's ready to go. And man, I don't blame him. And I, and I think what we learn from that. You know, this is perhaps this is just how Jesus wanted it for Paul and for us, so that we would never forget um, our dependence on Him, and we're going to see that in the story briefly here, and our dependence on Him, and especially now. I mean, if you're like me, we can. Um, it's kind of hard. I don't know if you're if you're a Christian, um, and or if you're someone who's. Uh, an out of church Christian or in church Christian, or you're somebody who's not yet a Christian, but you feel the way this world's going, and maybe you that's why you're not a Christian, perhaps. You know, you know, how could God possibly be in this? But yet, his disciples, these things had to be running through their mind. But we, he understands, I think, how we're feeling right about now. Ever since COVID, for me, the world is, um, I sensed it for a long, long time, and I talked about it, and I preached about it, and I wrote about it, but I really, really, really had a wake-up call during that time, and perhaps many of you who listened to this channel did as well. How long, oh Lord, will you tarry? How long till you come again? And uh, I'm reminded of Acts 111, and, and let's just go there real quick before we get into our story. We won't belabor this too long, but I do want you to be aware of that he said that the men of the angels after Jesus ascended. Now he's ascending in Acts, right after he's 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 ascending. And they also said, "Men of get these angels, why do you stand looking toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you've watched him go. He's going to now descend the Son of Man." It's what we long for, the parousia, the end times. The eschatological clock is ticking. He's coming back just like he said he would. He's going to come to take over as the reigning king, not as the suffering king. And here he is. Imagine his disciples. They see him. They know he's resurrected now. He's going to reveal himself now the third time. Verse uh, 1 of chapter 21, after these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, or, or Galilee was also called, and he manifests himself in this way. So Jesus, as we already read in 1 Corinthians 15, and as we see here, Jesus left witnesses, and he left very specific witnesses. And man, they left a record. That's 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 uh, ascertainable. That's that's accessible. That you can learn about, find out about. You can see how real it was, and how much evidence we actually have of of this event. Going back to again, probably the third time I've repeated what from Fleming Rutledge wrote in her book. If it was not for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we would not know who Jesus was. Think about that. And so Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus, we were told, and Nathaniel of Canaan and Galilee and sons of Zebedee, obviously James and John and two others of his disciples were together. And Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. 
sounds like my boy Peter going to go fishing. It's his livelihood. It's what he's good at, and it's what he loves to do, no doubt. No men like that, right? And they said to him, we will also come with you. And they went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Now, does that have a familiar tone to it? A familiar ring to it? A familiar place and feeling? They, they went with Jesus a lot of times out in the boat, out by the water, out by the sea, fishing. And so he reminded them of important familiarities. He reminded them of fishing. And no doubt many correlations came not only to what's getting ready to happen in this last miracle that he performs for them, besides his ascension, obviously, um, is is the fact that they were they were also fishing um, for men, they weren't just going to be fishing for fish, which was good, but they were going to be fishing for men as well. And so these important familiarities he wants to to remind them, and he's going to remind Peter and John, well, really more Peter than anybody about these same things. And I think it's also a reminder of their ultimate dependency on him as he's leaving. And they, they know it. Surely it's palpable. Surely they can feel it. But it's got to be like, you know, it's just got to be like on their mind. I mean, what are we going to do? How are we going to pull this thing off by ourselves without him? And I don't know about you, but I get up and I ask that question every single day. How am I going to make it till time for me to go or until Jesus comes back and, and be everything my wife needs her to be and everything my kids still need me to be, even though they're grown and gone for the most part? And, and how am I going to continue to provide and, and continue to be a faithful witness? And sometimes I mess up and sometimes I get it right. I don't know about you, but my encouragement today is just that this is a reminder to us that we're, we're dependent on Jesus. We need him. He, he created us to be dependent on him, to need him. And man, his disciples, they feel it. They really feel it. We see in verse 4, but when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood up on the beach, and yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Uh, Jesus loved, I just, I love Jesus at the beach because he loved the beach, and guess what? So do I. That's why I moved here. Couldn't afford to go on vacation, so I moved to the vacation. Bet you've never heard me say that before. But again, just like with Mary Magdalene, in John chapter 20, he's in his new body. No one really kind of recognizes them at first. We're not told really why that is. We can we can come up with all kind of theological speculation, but none of us know. The first thing he does, and we're going back to that dependency theme again, if I may, is that he feeds us. In verses 5 to 9, he tells them to cast the net on the right side because the right side is always the right side. Just so you know, left, not so good in the kingdom of God. Right, very good. So there's a FYI. He said, you'll find a catch. So they cast, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. And we find that out in Luke 5, 4, another instance where this very thing happens again. So these familiarities of fish, fishing for men, dependency on the Lord Jesus to provide, so he feeds us. And then they got out on the land and they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish, and fish placed on it and bread. So evidently, well, first of all, we see Peter, he jumps into the sea afterwards and he heads his way when he sees Jesus on the beach. But they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. And I think it's just a subtle reminder, at least for me it is, to, to remind us to use what it is that we have. God provides and he wants us to use it in his provision. And Jesus said, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. And so Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of large fish, 153 exactly. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Now there's a speculation that uh, a Greek zoologist back then, according to Jerome, um, stated this this 153 was significant. It symbolized the you know it symbolized that that's the amount of of, quant of quantification of fish that they knew at that time. 153 different types. Of course, we know there's a whole lot more than that. 
uh, but this was to to be symbolic of the universes, universality of the gospel. I don't know if that's the case, but it's interesting to think about anyway. But it denotes the miraculous character again of this provision. There were so many that they the net was torn. It's an overabundance. And many of us pray and seek God, and we don't always see that overabundance. And, and many of us pray, and then something happens really that really jars us and reminds us of his provision. He, so he gives us, as we walk on the path with him, he gives us a little miracle to continue. And so these men are reminded again that apart from Jesus, there's still nothing, not one thing that they can do without him. I woke up feeling that way this morning at 3.30 in the morning. That's not a good time to get up. When you get older, what is that? Laid back down about 4.30, got up, and I've been up ever since. But evidently God wanted me to get up, and one of the things that I was reminded of is, what am I doing? How can I possibly bring anything to the table? And yet his grace is enough, and Jesus reminds me again that he loves me and that he's got me. And his only commission to us is just to follow when he's giving out fish and cooking, we need to go. When he does a miracle, we need to receive it. And when it's time for him to get on that plane, on that jet plane, and leave again, not sure when he's going to be back again, that we trust him and we know he's there, he's never going to leave us. He's never going to forsake us. I hope you believe that today. Jesus said to him, come have breakfast. And none of the disciples ventured to question him. Who are you knowing that it was the Lord? Something about Jesus looked very much alike, but also very different. That, that, that state between his, his humanity and his resurrection body that we're all going to have that, is, that we know is, 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 is real and everything, but there's, there's, just, there's something about it that's very unique. And, you know, you wonder what was different about his appearance, but they knew that it was the Lord. No one dared to question him. And well, how did they know? Well, they knew because he answered their prayers. He brought the fish. He cooked it for them, but he also helped them catch it. He gave them a miracle, and he provided. And it's a reminder to him that he's going to continue to do this in some very difficult times. And we live in some difficult times. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and the fish likewise, kind of like another Last Supper, huh, maybe? Maybe they had the wine in the back. I don't know. Now, this is now the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. We'll pick up our time um, next week and wrap up in our first session, John, the Gospel of John. And talk about a little discussion that Peter and the Lord had that's really relevant to us in so many things. I look forward to sharing those few thoughts with you. A reminder today that Jesus has is, is, is left. He's, he's left the building. But he's coming back. And he understands that we're sad. He understands that some of us are going through some really insurmountable things. Some of you are. I know kind of tears behind my eyes, but it's because, you know, yeah, I'm going through some things, but some of you are going through some things uh, that would rock my world too, to know about. And you, and you, I'm encouraging you today to hold on to Jesus because he's holding on to you and he wants to walk with you. He's always there. He's going to provide. He's going to reveal himself. And he wants you to know that his presence is always with you and always accessible. It's accessible in the in the Eucharist, in the bread and the wine, in community with others, which is hard, I know, but we got to do it. However we can, we got to do it. And his presence is there every day as we as we seek him, as we as we pray and we ask him and we fervently pray, dear Lord, please touch me, be with me today. He's going to be with us. He's going to be with you. Have a great Lord's Day. I hope you get a good nap. Maybe you'll go out somewhere and get some sun. Maybe you'll read and reflect on 
who the Lord wants you to be this week. Be sure as you get this um, this video, um, you know, feel free to hit the follow button and uh, like it and share it with somebody if you think it ministers ministered to you. Maybe it'll minister to somebody else. I look forward to seeing you again soon. God bless. Maybe he's just hiding from the one thing. Maybe he's just hiding from the one thing in a fantastic distraction. Twelve steps forward and thirteen steps back. Twelve steps forward and thirteen steps back